compare your experience or experiences in Montreal versus in the United States pertaining to race and how you were accepted or not accepted. Was we, there a big difference? Oh, tremendous difference. Yeah. Tremendous difference. First of all, we got married in February and went to our first spring training in April. On our way to spring, and we were determined to get to spring training on time and be ready to play. And when I say we, that's the way it was. I of mean, I was, I was in on all this. I didn't walk behind him. I walked beside him, and we were in it together. Um, we were, I, I dressed for, I have to put dress in here because Jack had given me an ermine coat uh, that he had paid down on and paid on for the whole five years that we were in cash. So I had on my ermine coat and my Harlem hat. I bought a hat in Harlem, and I had my handbag, and I was really, I was ready. Um, we were, the stewardess on the plane came when we got to New Orleans, came to our seats and said, uh, you, you need to go into the office. We thought it was just a stopover. And so Jack got up and went to the office, and the stewardess came back to me, and she said, I think you need to follow him. And we didn't know it, but we were being bumped from the plane. Um, this is en route to Florida? En route to our first spring training in Florida. Florida, yes. When I walked into the airport, I saw Jack arguing with somebody at a, at a counter, and I thought I should be over there because we don't want anything to go wrong. We were very nervous. I was very nervous about moving, going into the South. I'd never been South. I'd read oh. a lot of things about the South, and uh, I just I was nervous. So uh, before I went over there, though, I noticed the signs, white women, black, uh, what are they called, Negro women, I guess. And I went in the white woman's dressing room. I had to do something to make restore my sense of power, of, you know, or who I am or whatever. And so I went in the woman's white women's bathroom. Nobody stopped me. They looked at me like I was crazy. But, you know, I, I felt better when I came out. And then I went over and, went and took Jack's arm and I said, what? going on he said well we're being taken off the plane and they don't give us a good explanation and they say there's nothing else going out tonight and we're going to have to stay here overnight so we didn't have any recourse because he was talking to the supervisor and that was it so we went to a hotel oh, a terrible oh. rundown place that Jack remembered from when he'd been on tour and uh, the beds were like like newspaper was on 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 the bed, you know, this crinkly, oh, out wow. lopsided, whatever. Anyway, it didn't do anything for our spirits. It made us feel even worse. And we spent the night there and went back. We um, were put on another plane, and when they got to Pensacola, Florida, they called us again, and pulled, called us in and gave us the same story that they had to put on uh, extra gasoline or something. We saw a white couple going on the plane. We were furious, but you almost feel like you cannot make trouble when you don't know what the circumstances are, who's going to come to your aid if yes. you do make trouble. And we had to get to that Daytona Beach April 1st. I mean, we just didn't have time to be arrested or to anything. <laughs> so we, um, we complied, and we got off, and we decided to take a bus the rest of the way. And we took a bus from Jacksonville on into Daytona Beach, Florida. And even on the bus, I had the f first experience of having to sit on the back of the bus. Oh, even on the bus. Even on the bus. Back, yeah. We had to sit on the back of the bus. They forced us back there. And pretty soon when people started coming in from the fields and whatnot, there were a lot of black people on the bus, but they had to stand because the, all the seats were taken. We developed on that back seat a little <laughs> scheme whereby we'd sit up, and, and somebody else could sit back, and I made more room on the on the back bench. Or we take turns standing. I was, there was a co there was a coordinated, cooperative spirit that developed on a bus ride. That's the only way I can recover, and that's my way of dealing with any kind of stress or trauma, is to look for signs of hope. And this little business on the bus made me feel good. I said, Oh, black people can stand together. <laughs> And we're not going to let anybody stand up too long, and, you know, and it was it was great. I made a whole thing out of it. But um, when we got to Daytona, the, that was just the beginning. 
because Jacksonville, in Jacksonville, the game was called off because Jack was there. They locked the park and wouldn't allow the team on the, on the grounds. In Stanford, Stanford, Florida, Jack was on the field, and they sent the police out on the field to escort him in. They said they didn't allow mixed games. Mm. Um, so we had real raw experiences like that. Um, we did, couldn't live with the team in the hotel, of course. They lived right on the beach, and we lived. We were placed with a black family. But that, too, was a blessing for that particular thing. It was such a relief to get into the home of uh, Joe and Duff Harris every evening where we had a home, and we didn't have the scrutiny of the, what's happening out in the white world, and we didn't have the pressures of that. We had a little tiny bedroom at the top of the stairs in the, in the Harris home, and um, we were on our honeymoon, so we didn't mind. We just oh, loved my. being up there by ourselves. <laughs> And we played a little gin rummy, and we made love, and we just did all the, you know, we we had a grand time. In Vero Beach, for instance, they allowed black people into the stand, but they had a hole in the fence. They couldn't come through the turnstile. They had a hole in the back backfield fence, and they had a stoop and come in through this hole in the fence. It was so humiliating and so terrible, and I refused to go sit in that park. I have photographs of it where black people were dressed up to come to that park. The yeah. men had on hats. Uh, the women were dressed. It was it was an outing for them, a really lovely outing. And they went, and when the black section filled up, they had to sit on the field on the ground. Hmm. So if an outfield, a ball came to the outfield, they uh-huh. had to scramble like animals. Yeah. It was so humiliating and so distasteful that I used to go to the park and sit in the car and I wouldn't go in. I'd listen, try to hear the game on the, on the radio. Mm-hmm. Um, so all through the, all through Florida, we had that experience. Now here's Rachel again with looking for the bright side. When we had the Duff Harris house, which was like home, and the, they were the people that the Harrises knew were very politically astute, and they were working together. For instance, they were going to get black bus drivers uh, while we were there. They were working to get black bus drivers, and they were organizing around that. They also, when Jack hit it, Jack got very uptight and, and went into a hitting slump while we were there. When he got finally got the first hit, they called all the faculty in from Bethune-Cookman College. Oh, yeah. And Mrs. Bethune was still alive. Oh. And uh, they had a dinner in their house celebrating Jack. Uh, and victory of being able to start hitting and they brought uh, things from the agricultural school fresh vegetables and chickens <laughs> and everything else to the to the, their house uh, so we had that and then we had the great pleasure and excitement of meeting Mary with Cloud Bethune she, oh, went, uh, she was a great lady and, and very gracious and warm and wonderful to us and she said you keep on, you're doing the right thing, and a lot of encouragement came from her. We had this horrendous experience, really. We were immersed in a situation in the South that we had never been quite challenged to that extent and physically threatened as we were, as we felt we were in the South. So we were glad to get out of there. I guess. And we were assigned to Montreal taking all this baggage with me up to Montreal, the club gave us, the club had not identified our living quarters. They gave us a list of apartments. And I thought, what did they know? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, this is not going to go well. But anyway, I took the list, and I, the first place I selected on DeGaspe Street, I rang the bell with a lot of trepidation, and the woman came out, and she's smiling, and she didn't, react to my color. This is in Montreal now. In Montreal. Yes. If she reacted to my color, it was not visible. She said, oh, come in, and you <laughs> come from the ball club, and I said, yes, and so forth. We sat, and, and she took me around, and I knew the signs when someone's going to turn you off and someone's going to reject you. Uh, you know the signs right away. I mean, they, they take this when they first see you, there's a startled look or whatever, or the, or the despairing look. And she wouldn't have shown me around if she didn't intend to let me think about it. 
Well, I loved the apartment. It was beautifully organized and very nicely kept in a nice neighborhood. It had a nice back porch and a lot of features that I liked. So we sat down and started talking, and she said, you know, I really would like you to use my linens and my china and my and my uh, glassware. So she said, I'm leaving everything here for you. And another sign, another good sign wow. that she was um, not discriminating against me. In other words, she's welcoming me in a, in a very different way. And that day we signed the lease. Now, that. Uh, we had that same kind of reception in the ballpark when Jack got out on the field, big excitement, um, none of the, the uh, hate notes we had been getting uh, in other situations, and none of the threats. He didn't need special guards. And this little neighborhood, DeGaspe Street, I was pregnant with Jackie Jr. after we moved there. And um, everybody had there was a tendency on the block for people to come out on their back porches in the evening so you'd wave to people down down next wow, door and down this way and that <laughs> when the women saw that I was pregnant they came in to tell me that they wanted to help now there was rationing of uh, you had to have stamps food stamps ration stamps so they would come in and bring me extra stamps so I should get you know the proper nutrition they uh, knew I was sewing my clothes, and they came in to put the hems in my dresses. Oh, my goodness. Um, if I come walking down the street with my groceries, the kids would come run and help me carry them into the house. Um, things I wasn't accustomed to anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. And in, even in Los Angeles, I didn't get that kind of welcome, you know, you're one of us. And they spoke French, and I didn't speak French. So we couldn't even communicate that way, not verbally. Um, and it was mostly nodding and smiling and doing. And doing. Um, that kept us going. And one, I, one day of first, oh, Jack had to go on the road. And the women noticed that I wasn't coming out on the porch. So they came in to, to see, to be sure that I was all right and to invite me to their porch, you know, like, I, you know, because you, you must be lonely, you know. I mean, they didn't say it in so many words, but that was the feeling that they conveyed to me. So I started to do my part. That my, my porch, you had to, there was a French-Canadian family above me with a lot of children, and I had a screen door on my porch. So I started putting big bowls of fruit on my kitchen oh. table. So when the kids came down the stairs, they could peek in, and then they would knock, you know. And I just, I decided they must be poor because they had something like eight kids. And so I would open the door and, and invite them in and give them fruit and, you know, try to reciprocate in some way because I do believe in reciprocation as part of a relationship. And uh, I didn't want them caring, taking care of me. I wanted to, to, to form a relationship with them so I could do for them as well in whatever way I could. How long were you there? And we were there a whole season. A whole season. A season from April through October. And we won the Little World Series that year. <laughs> and Jack was very instrumental in that happening. So um, the final game, after the final game, a crowd formed. And a reporter wrote, and, and they followed Jack, and they ran after him. And then finally got him and put him up on his shoulders. And the a reporter wrote, it's one of the few times in history when a mob chases a black man and to celebrate him. 